<laughs> Where did the guys get them from, though? Production staff. Did you, did you bring them over? That's great. I think I'd better acknowledge, Wayne, it was one of, I thought, the most amusing cartoons I've ever seen, perhaps because I relate to it. Uh, it was when I had, had been an erstwhile candidate for sheriff of Cook County. He made the statement, not once, but twice. President Nixon is a madman. You sickened me. But the question I would like to ask you now is, do you think if you had made that statement about the head of any of these Shangri-La governments that you're talking about and praying for, that you would today be a free woman or even allowed airtime? Okay, let's go to the answer. Uh, I would like to retract what I said about Richard Nixon. I don't think he's a madman. I think he's a very clever, shrewd man who... Um, who is lying to us all, unfortunately. And he is clever because we are believing what he is saying. And it may cost us our country. Do you think that just because a woman is living out of wedlock, she and her children should be condemned to starvation? No, but I don't think that she should have the luxury of a connubial companion under those circumstances, because if he has money enough to support her or could support the household and he's enjoying uh, her bed and her board, then certainly he ought to contribute something to that family and the government shouldn't. Well, well can I interrupt? He, the question is, the key question is, if the man, is the man capable of supporting the family? You, uh, you enter into what they, you might call quite a thicket there, if you're going to try to, uh, to determine that. And you're going to have, again, what they were doing previously, welfare people bursting into people's homes in the middle of the night, without knocking, without a warrant, looking under beds. And I don't think that's proper conduct for the well, majestic government of the, government cause, you of don't the United States. think proper conduct is promiscuity, do you, Father? That's not necessarily promiscuity. I wouldn't condemn those people. I don't say it's the type of behavior I encourage, but these th that's part of your culture of poverty. You have it in all manner of countries, possibly the only place you don't have it in some communist countries where like Cuba, where they've got rid of the culture of poverty, but you'd certainly have a lot of it in Puerto Rico and other places. It's, uh, th this casualness about that is, uh, that's part of it, and uh, you're not going to change it by these draconian measures. Well, I don't know what's draconian about the fact that a woman on government welfare should support a pimp. The uh, way I see it tonight, well, I don't exactly see it, the way my feet feel, uh, we're gonna be zapped with snow tonight. As a matter of fact, You'll be up to your zap and zap by tomorrow at this time. That's our uh, Thanksgiving holiday forecast. Now let's uh, take a look at... Um... Oh, oh, Howard. <laughs> I'm sorry to usurp this, Bob, but this is my way of telling you on behalf of management, John, that uh, they're considering a, a change of weathermen at Channel 7. You're a wonderful disc jockey, Howard, an outstanding interviewer, and I have a feeling you could probably replace me in a minute. Well, my feet hurt enough to be able to almost <laughs> call the weather. Ladies and gentlemen, our wonderful guest tonight, John Coleman, will be talking to him in just a moment on Chicago. Number one, you're on Chicago. Yes, my name is Catherine McLean, and I'm directing my question to either Merrick or Myrna. And I'd like to know if the younger generation uh, uses the um, generation gap as an excuse for uh, copping out or... You know, just use it for an uh, excuse for doing things that are wrong and they know are wrong and against their parents and other people. And this sounds like a young lady calling. Are you... Yes, young... I'm 16. Hmm, very interesting that we should have that question posed by a 16-year-old. Do you think that really what you're doing is copping out by rejecting society, Mark? <laughs> Of course not. I... Of course not. Not at all. I'm not rejecting society because it's like the thing to do or you think who's ever asking this question. I'm doing something I feel comfortable. I'm leading a type of life that I want to lead. I'm not hurting anybody. I love the young lady I'm living with. I want to do what I want. I want to go where I want. I want to work at the type of job. I, I'm not hurting my parents in my mind. But in his society, mind, I'm hurting him. In society's mind, Mark, you, would let me society finish. ever get any place? You know, questions if... like this really bug me. Well, don't see. be bugged. It's a uh... bunch of guilt feelings. I don't know where this young lady ever, you know, can ask a question like this. You know, Mark, you're not as emotionally stable as your dad. Well, you're fine. the one that's you doing know, the I like to give off a little dad. steam. I like to get a little hot. Well, it's perfectly all right. Because, but if everyone then decided they should go their own route in society, what no, would happen I'm not to society? Well, you yeah. just did say it. I'm saying that personally, I want to lead a type of life that I'm comfortable with without somebody else telling me which way to move. 
how to lead my life. I want to conform to the law. I want everyone to conform to the law. But I don't want anyone telling me that I need a marriage contract to live with a woman. I don't want anyone telling me I've got to wear my hair short or that I have to wear, you know, I don't want that. You know, I really don't. And another thing, you know, you're talking about the generation gap. This whole show is supposed to be about that, not necessarily about living together. Okay. I had absolutely no communication with my father for years, all through high school and college, nothing. He was a perfect stranger to me. It wasn't until after college that I moved out west, I was there for a few years, he started writing me, and we came a little closer. I can honestly say, like, tonight's as close as we've been in years. Sir, if you're going to use this microphone for making, if, if you're going to make charges, sir, then state your case in a way that you can document it. All right, I will state it in the way I can document it, in a very general way which everybody can know. And this is the main thing. When Commander Rockwell died, he left to Matt Kale an international organization. We had headquarters all across the world. We had them all across the United States. We had a membership and a following in the, in the thousands. And Matt Kale, within a period of two years, degenerated that organization. He severed all ties with our international groups. He, in fact, he just kicked out the, our leader in England. And he, is, he went from one headquarters to another trying to shut them down. He did, the, he did the same thing, him and his flunkies, tried to do here in Chicago, and this is why we broke for them. All right, now, now, Mr. Collin, before you go any farther, and while you're still on the line, I'd like to have Mr. Kale answer your charges. Fine. Uh, Mr. Kale, will you go ahead now? Uh, Mr. Collin can hear you on the uh, television, also on the phone. Well, Howard, I think this is all a bunch of wild, unsubstantiated charges, completely ridiculous. Uh, this person apparently has been off on an ego trip. Uh, he has some problems stemming from his uh, uh, Jewish background and uh, he fancies himself to be the uh, real head of the National Socialist Movement. I think uh, it's rather ridiculous that a person... A moment ago you said you didn't know these people that headed this splinter group and now you accuse him of being a Jew. You must know him then. Uh, you must have misunderstood. I have known so I asked you to identify anybody you knew in that splinter group. I you didn't said identify. I don't know anybody at all in it. I didn't, no, I did not say that. I said I did not care to uh, dignify them. Could I set a, some ground? Yes, ground please wall? do. Please. See, I know of Mr. Mancusi, and I know of his reputation. Mancuso, Mr. I'm, I'm, I did the same thing the last time. Yeah, we I know you did. Let's that? stop it right now, Mancuso. shall we? Mancuso. Hey, don't, don't misunderstand my mind. I, I don't like politicians as far as the automobile business. Uh, any more than Mr. Mancusi obviously does. I mean, we got these... Jim Mancuso. Mr. Either Mancuso. call me Jim or Mancuso. I'm, I'm Either sorry. one. I'm not Mancuso, Chevrolet, and Skokie, yeah. remember? I'm not okay. doing it intentionally. <laughs> Believe me. Oh, well, it's I'm all right. Not, Go ahead. Thinking. It gives me a chance Why to repeat it every once in a while. Why the heck would I do that? No, fine. Thank you very Jim, much, Tony. I'm, I apologize for doing it. Yeah. I, I, Mancuso, I'm Chevrolet, stupid, right? I'm stupid. I must be. I didn't bring up England, you know. Mr. Mancusi brought it up. All right, what would you like to say about it, Mr. Mancuso is the name. Jim Mancuso, remember? Yeah, just so we get it straight. Take a look at the whole picture and see what's being done. Now, one of the figures in Mr. Till's and Tony's book, I'm sorry, it's Till, isn't it? Right. <laughs> one of the figures about... <laughs> so that this is the recommendation from a medical man, then, is that they should seek out the help. They shouldn't be content uh, to allow themselves to become a receptacle for semen and not uh, experience some gratification themselves. I mean, they should expect it and they should ask it. I think so, provided that's what they want. Now, I'm sure there are a very, very small percentage of women who don't really have any interest in experiencing an orgasm but for the rest of them it's possible and there's no reason why they can't achieve it if they want to in other words it's one of those incidents and in, uh, in a patient's life that can be handled properly by a trained man of science again with the same requirements a motivated patient a motivated psychiatrist and some good luck let's go back to the audience now and dr david rubin uh, dr rubin why do you refuse just a minute just a minute okay. just a minute Look at him. Take this gentleman out of the audience. Look at him. Your goddamn information is oppressing me. It's oppressing people like me. I want to know why you refuse to talk about it. Why do you refuse to talk about it? Where did you get your goddamn information? All right, take this gentleman out of here. Let him go out. Let him go. Let him go. Let him go. All right, let's continue this show. Let's remove those gentlemen if they don't want to stay here and be content to learn. All right. We'll go back now to our show in progress. All right, please, can we have the cameras over here and let's not belabor this situation. Uh, whether or not he was going to... Uh, uh, exert some physical violence on Dr. Rubin, I didn't know. 
Uh, I'm one of those people who, uh, I guess, are impetuous, and I thought that if there was a possibility that a guest of mine, the uh, same as it were my home, I consider this my home. It's my domain from 12 to 1 every night. Except tonight. And I, yes, except tonight. <laughs> and I felt that if someone was going to invade the privacy of my home and attack my guest, I was going to defend my guest, whether he needed it or not. He might be a karate champion, but I didn't know that, and it wouldn't have made any difference if it had been Jack Dempsey sitting here. I was going to protect that, which is my prerogative to protect my guest. And... Uh, Obviously, it didn't, he didn't require protection. I don't mean to say that. But I think the newspaper, and thank heavens they did, all the newspapers, blew it way out of proportion. That is the amount of violence that was created in the studio. But, of course, it did uh, the show quite proud because I'm sure that we had an enormous audience as a result of that press. That press was not motivated by this radio station or by television station or by me. It was motivated by a call to one of the city desks from one of the participants in the audience. And we didn't know even that they had been tipped off until they called us. Brought out the truth beautifully, I thought. On, that's, uh, that's on welfare right. rights, you're crazy on Vietnam, but on welfare rights, you were all right. Witches, athletes, police, Leftists, rightists, entertainers, clergy, former clergy, hypnotists, nudists, sex researchers. Now that's what we call a variety show. We're glad you've joined us in Howard Miller's Chicago. And now, here's Howard. Again, how do you do, ladies and gentlemen? And thank you so very much for the opportunity of visiting you in your home, wherever you are. We hope that you're going to enjoy our discussion tonight, and I think you will. If I began this program by saying that you frequently talk without saying words, you'd question just exactly what I meant. Well, that, of course, is a matter of the gestures that you use. This is nonverbal communication. You don't I need an ally, and there's no it is not one so surprising that I you feel very strange, the but nice. Your heart goes in a pattern. I don't judge what's the I matter. Because I've been there I once or twice. Put your head on my shoulder, he meets someone who's older. I'm down with a velvet There is nothing you can take to relieve that pleasant day. You're not big, you're just in love. Don, it might be interesting to get a call uh, now from our public line. Six, you're on Chicago with Donald O'Connor. You don't need any analyzing. It is not so surprising. How dare you do that without me being there? <laughs> is that I'll echo? That's echo. Oh. I'll kill you, my dear boy. Oh, sweetheart, how are you? Well, I'm fine. I, I, I want to wish you all the luck in the world with the play, Donald. Well, thank you, lover. I just wish you were in it. And I, I wish I were, too, but, you know, I well, someone just said to me, you know, why are you on the phone? Why don't you just open the window and talk from New York? <laughs> <laughs> calling from New York, Don. <laughs> are you calling from New York? Well, where do you think I am? In Siberia? <laughs> of course I'm in New York. Well, I, I didn't know. And when we did Well, I wanted to be a surprise. Well, it sure was, and I just want to tell you, I wish I could be there for your opening night, and I wish you all the luck, and I send you all the love in the world, Donald. Thank you, my sweetheart. All right, dear, from mother to son, goodbye. Uh, how do you account for the fact that some people are healed and some are not? Where I lies the difference? I wish I could answer that question. I'd give anything in the world if I knew the answer to that question. 
Because They've people coming to you is not unlike people going to the Lourdes in France. They go to be cured of an affliction, an ailment. People come to you by the thousands, by the droves. Some walk away cured and some don't. Would you think that that is uh, meaningful, that they profess less faith, the ones who are not cured? Would that no, no. I don't understand why. I'd give anything in the world if I understood why some people are healed and some Maybe it's none of our business. Not. Maybe that's the way he works. You know, sometimes I have come to the conclusion that it's just things. He knows exactly what he's doing. It's his business. He does it, you know. But one thing is true, and that is that um, after attending the service, they're never quite the same. The spiritual blessing sometimes is even greater than some of the physical healings. A reporter came to the Shrine Auditorium not too long ago, and uh, as the folk were coming out to the great auditorium, uh, he questioned many who were still leaving in the wheelchair. And he reported in one of the papers and said, you know the amazing thing? I didn't find one single one who left disappointed. Uh, Hamlet is a very philosophical play. Yes. Yes. And it's very heavy and it's very deep and it's it's saying the same thing that all the kids are saying today. You know. And it might make it a lot easier for kids to listen to Hamlet Absolutely, yeah. if uh, it were done with rock music. Okay. Now that we've uh, put the thought in your mind, perhaps you're going to produce Hamlet with rock, and we'll be right back with this <laughs> cast from 1776 in just one moment. Where do I order? Is the declaration ready to be signed? It is. Very well. Call the roll. New Hampshire. Dr. Josiah Bartlett. Massachusetts, Mr. John Adams. Rhode Island, Mr. Stephen Hopkins. Connecticut, Mr. Roger Sherman. New York, Mr. Lewis Morris. New Jersey, the Reverend Jonathan Witherspoon. Pennsylvania, Dr. Benjamin Franklin. Delaware, Mr. Caesar Rodney. Maryland, Mr. Samuel Chase. Virginia, Mr. Thomas Jefferson. North Carolina, Mr. Joseph Hughes. South Carolina, Mr. Edward Brackley. Georgia, Dr. Lyman Hall. This is Mr. Paul Brunet, ladies and gentlemen. We've been talking about dress designing. We're about now to show you the fashions of the current and the next year that Paul has designed. And Paul, I want to stress again to the audience so that there's no confusion on their parts that all of these gentlemen, these are all men who are going to be fashioning in the role that they play in their um, avocation or their vocation, yeah. which is the female impersonator. Yes. But all the models you'll see are young gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. And with that, let the show begin. Let the fashion show and parade begin. And if you'll take over, Paul, and uh, do the narration, perhaps I'll have a few questions. I hope you do. The first one we have is Jackie Knight. Jackie's wearing black jet beaded lace with a white silk overcoat lined in black. The coat snaps off and is reversible to black. There we have it. Now this obviously is a very formal... Uh, yes, strictly formal. It could be yeah. for any formal occasion. Uh -huh, uh -huh, California, here I come. Right back where I started from. The flowers, well that's enough of that. Ain't gonna get any applause to nobody here but these fellas. And um, no, stop drinking, but don't applaud. Anyhow, uh, then <laughs> after that show, Eddie Cantor came in in a show called The Merry Rounders. He introduced the new song. This is the way Eddie Cantor used to sing, Susie. If you knew Susie like I know Susie, oh, oh. Oh, what a girl, the sweet young lassie is oh so classy. Oh, oh, oh my goodness, what a chassis. I had a mustache as cute as a pup. Susie. 
she kissed me and she burnt the darn thing up if you do. That's all right. And uh, <coughs> then I made, <coughs> pardon me, I got to get a room tonight. The, uh, <coughs> one of the first movies that I made, the talkies, was a picture called Lucky Boy. And that opened here, too, at the United Artists Theatre. And I'd written a song in collaboration, uh, but I <coughs> thought it was too corny. <coughs> but the song was a big hit. I wouldn't have my name on it. Shows you what a, what a fool I was. <laughs> uh, Schlemiel, I was going to say. Anyhow, uh, it's still a big hit today. It's called My Mother's Eyes. One bright and guiding light that taught me wrong from right I found in my mother's eyes. Well, I said it's a corny ballad, maybe, but they're still singing it. And I think people will still be singing it after all the rock and roll people have gone down the, or up or down the road to their fathers. One song I'd like to uh, finish for you. Uh, I visit Mr. Truman, bless him, every time I come back from the wars. And he was saying the other day to me, Georgie, why is it that no one is singing or writing a patriotic song these days? Uh, like Irving Berlin or George Cohan. So I'm a kind of a songwriter. I wrote one, and it's called The Flag Still There, Mr. Key, dedicated to the memory of Francis Scott Key, who wrote the Star Spangled Banner. I didn't know Mr. Key, but he and Jack Benny were very good friends. They had a fight over Barbara Fritchie or something. Anyhow, so... <laughs> I'm going to sing you this song, and after I finish the first chorus of mine, a chorus of a better song by George M. Cohan, and then the finish. Eddie? At the dawning of a morning not so long ago, Francis Scott Key wrote some poetry. Oh, the ramparts he watched every flare was the flag that he loved standing there. Would it stand through the perilous night? Yes, it did, cause it stands for the right. Yes, the flag's still there, Mr. Key, and it's flying high for you and for me. So look down from above at the land that you love and hear your song of victory. Yes, the flag's still there, Mr. Key, and waving over all the brave and the free. Oh, say, you can see that our flag's still there, Mr. Key, and it's a grand old flag. It's a high-flying flag, and forever and there, may it wave. It's the emblem of the land we love, the home of the free and the brave. Every heart beats true for the red, white, and blue, for there's never a boast or brag. Should old acquaintance be forgot, keep your eye on the grand old flag. Oh, say you can see that our flag's still there, Mr. Key. <coughs> Thanks, Just John. Beautiful. Thank you. Just beautiful. Thank you, sweetheart. Ladies and gentlemen, that's talent. That's an American. That's talent. We'll be back in just a moment with Georgie Jessel. Fine. I think it most interesting that an atheist would start a church, and I think that atheist ought to tell us about that church. Madeline Murray O'Hare has begun a new church. Does it have a, a, an official name, Madeline? Oh, yes, it does. It's Poor Richard. Poor Richard's Universal Life Church of American Atheists. And uh, the whole idea is to gain the uh, special privileges uh, for this church that is given to all of the other churches by government uh, tax exemption and uh, uh, tax grants, uh, money for parochial schools. I'm delighted about Illinois. You have just given us our first atheist schools here because just as soon as they finish passing this bill now, uh, we will immediately open up atheist elementary schools, and we then will be able to get the money that you're giving You'll be funded by the state of we'll Illinois. We'll be funded for... by the state of Illinois. Isn't that jolly? Uh, how do you think about that, uh, Pastor Lyons? It's well, th this would... bears out something we've said all along, of course, that people who are unable and unwilling to support their own faith are always looking for a handout someplace. Isn't and that since, true? Do you know how much Baylor University got? Since government has a lot of money, then uh, government is the obvious place to go. Now, you think atheist schools should be funded by the th government? Th this is back to the state church setup. And when you have a state church setup, those that align themselves with the government 
are more than willing to persecute those who desire to have really free religion and depend upon themselves and, and their own beliefs. You know, and the this Debaptists is what happens. The, whole, the, the Middle Ages are, are full of this, that you have a state church, then you have persecution. When you have religious persecution, no longer do you have a free country. The Baptists take money. Yes, Look, they do, all, all kinds of money. Don't fool anyone now. In the South, for instance, when there's been a, a university that has been started by Baptists, then the trustees of that university look for government funds and take a little bit. The state yes, convention cuts them bit. off, and the people are unwilling for this kind of thing. Baptists believe in separation of church and state. Do you know how many state, business organizations the Baptist liberty, Church has in Dallas which are tax-free, including this. a bowling alley? For heaven's sake. You take, the Baptist Church takes money hand over fist, and the Baptist Church takes government land, property, and buildings in a giveaway by the Health, Education, and Welfare Department, and the, ta the Baptist Church is also tax-free. The Baptist Church has in lease-back gimmicks with Bemis bags, Borden milk, Rath meat, Fruhoff truck, a Burlington Mills, and you sit there and say that the Baptists don't dip into the till, well, what you're would one be of the, the doctrines biggest let's, violators. Let, let's but, as always, on Friday night, we like to thank the men who make all of this possible. A lot of people behind just one television show, and I think they're all entitled to a huge raise, so management take note. We'll see you on Monday night, ladies and gentlemen, an interesting uh, show. We'll solve your sex problems over the telephone with Miss Ann Walburn. That's Monday on Chicago. Good night. Chicago guests stay at the luxurious executive house, home of the famous 71 Club restaurant. Howard Miller is president of Arizona Properties of Illinois, Incorporated. Viewer participation phone calls are prearranged for those expressing an interest in questioning our guests prior to the taping of our program. This is Wayne Atkinson speaking.